Alleluia. Well, praise God. We're so excited about what God's doing, and we're uh, uh, so excited to be here for another great hour of power here on Wednesday evening at Faith Builders International. God bless you. Uh, good to have everybody with us. Good to have everyone watching online. Uh, those of you that are watching online, we welcome you, and we ask that uh, you join in. When we say amen, you say amen. When we shout, you shout. God's going to help us. Uh, in a lot of different areas tonight as we look at what the Lord has for us to see. Let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, we'll begin here in verse 10. I said something last week at the end of the uh, uh, message. And it was simply this, that an enemy exposed is an enemy defeated. And so we want to continue along these lines that we have been uh, teaching on uh, from last week on knowing your enemy. And we dealt uh, a lot last week with girding up the loose ends of your mind and not allowing yourself uh, to become uh, deceived into thinking that, for instance, the way the world thinks about certain things is the way that we're supposed to think when the Word of God is our standard. Well, in building on that concept and building on that revelation that the Word of God shares with us, uh, we're going to deal tonight with uh, how the enemy begins to try to get in to those circumstances of our lives and the door that he tries to enter through. So in Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul, a familiar passage of Scripture uh, concerning the, the whole armor of God. But Paul in verse 10, chapter 6 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And he says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For... We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And then he says, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, there's been a wealth of teaching on these verses and uh, uh in one series that we taught, we outlined this, uh, what Paul was dealing with when he talked about principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. We're, we're not going to take the time to get into that. Uh, suffice it to say, notice what he says uh, in the beginning of that verse, verse 12. For we wrestle not, against flesh and blood. So Paul starts off by telling us who or what we're not fighting against. All right? We're not fighting against flesh and blood. Now that's important to see. All right, tell your neighbor right there beside you, we're not fighting flesh and blood. All right, this is so important. And here's why. Because... Very often, the enemy, and, and I, I was even dealing with this in staff meeting to some extent this morning, the enemy wants to get you distracted, all right? He, he is a very good covert operator, all right? He wants to get you distracted. And one of the ways that he tries to get you off of what your real enemy is and who your real enemy is, is by getting you to think that people are the problem, that people are the issue, that this individual is the issue, or that this, what this person is doing, their attitude, their this, their that, is the problem. But Paul says here, we don't wrestle, we don't fight, we don't grapple with. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. Then he says what the battle is against. Principalities, powers, wickedness, evil spirits. All right? He says that's who the battle is with. So the real enemy is the devil. 
The real enemy is those spirits that stand behind that circumstance. Now, in Ephesians 6, you're right there. And uh, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. That word there, when it, it uses the, words, the word wiles. Now, you may have heard this at some point. I don't know that, that uh, many people use it anymore, but I'm old enough to remember this word. People will say, well, that guy's really wily. You got to watch him because he's wily. All right, what that means is sneaky, conniving, all right? You got to watch him. It, listen, it can be voiced this way. He has an ulterior motive, all right? This word, wiles, it means uh, methods or strategies of the devil. He said that you have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, Put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against the methods or the strategies of the devil. The methods or the strategies of the devil. So what does that mean? I, as a believer, have to spend time understanding, comprehending, coming to a realization of what his methods are or his strategies are. All right? What his methods or his strategies are. Uh, in the book, The Art of War, which obviously is not a, a spiritual book, but yet it, it tells us something about warfare, the author, Sun Tzu, he made this statement. He said the very first thing in understanding warfare is knowing your enemy understanding who your enemy is. Well, you know, all wisdom comes from God. Any, any wisdom that's godly, any wisdom that is, is beneficial. And so the Word of God is replete with teaching on how we can know the strategies or the methods of our enemy, of our adversary, of our foe, the devil. If we can understand his strategy, if we can understand his methods, then we can know what we're fighting and stand against it. So we already know, number one, we already know people are not our enemy. Amen. People are not our enemy. The devil and his cohorts are our enemy, all right? He said, I'll, I'll remind you again, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, so we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but this is who we are wrestling against. This is who we are encountering. This is who we are facing off with. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. They are, yes, they are defeated principalities, defeated powers, defeated spiritual wickedness, but that's still who we're dealing with. Defeated or not, that's who we're dealing with. We're not dealing with people. Now, the reason this is so important is because, again, because the enemy is a master at distraction. And he'll get you focused on a person when in reality it's a spiritual foe that's causing the problem. Hallelujah. So we know the devil is sneaky, crafty, deceptive. Hallelujah. See, this is why you got to know him. You know, if you, if you see a guy on TV, and you don't see this much anymore, I'm old enough to remember seeing it, and they're out there with a big placard in front of a bunch of used cars. And he says, hey folks, this is Bargain Bob. Come on down, I'll make you a deal you can't pass up. 
And he takes you over to this car that even you look at it and it looks too good to be true for that price. Here's this car right here, low miles, brand new tires, everything's great on it. Runs like a new one, low miles, $49.95. Well, you look at him and you think, that guy is deceptive. He's sneaky. You're not just going to run down and buy a car from Bargain Bob. All right? Because you're aware that that's too good to be true. You can, you can know that. The devil is sneaky. Contrary to popular belief, he just doesn't do things out in the open. All right? Very often, very often by the time somebody recognizes that it's the enemy at work, he's already caused some level of destruction in their life. And we're going to talk about that further as we, go, as we go along. But if I can first of all begin to understand, people are not my enemy. The devil is the enemy. So he's sneaky, he's crafty, he's deceptive. And that's why the Bible tells us on more than one occasion to be on our guard against that deception. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, roameth about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Now, why does it tell us to be sober-minded? Why does it tell us to be alert, to be active, to be watching? Because he's going to try to get us distracted. Hallelujah. Do you see this? He's going to try to get us distracted. But we have to be, we have to keep our focus. Stay on our guard. Understand, people are not my problem. The, the, the circumstances that I'm dealing with in this person, the, the, the person is not my problem. I can't be distracted by that. Because the enemy's looking for a way to weasel his way in to my life into my family, into my ministry by getting me focused on the people. I, I can't tell you, on more than one occasion, I've talked to pastors and, and when you'll sit down and talk to them, they'll say, I just, the people, I, I just got this problem and I got this problem and I got that problem and sister so-and-so is causing a problem and brother so-and-so is causing a problem. They are looking at the people and it's not the people. The people might be either knowingly or unknowingly used by the devil, but that pastor has to stand his guard and take his position of authority because the people are not his problem. There may be people that have to go because they are, they're, they're in compliance with what the enemy wants. They're causing strife. They're causing problems. But here's the issue. At the end of the day, though, it is not that person as much as it is the devil operating through them. Strife is as, well, I started to say is as much. Strife is a spirit. There's a spirit that stands behind strife. And you can't deal with strife solely on a natural level. That's part of it. But you got to get deeper than that. All right? The devil's goal is to get us focused on something other than the real threat. So yes, the person is an issue, but the real threat is the spirit they're yielding to. Oh, glory. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. Notice he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now see, that sounds familiar. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Though we walk 
in the flesh, meaning we conduct our lives in the flesh. But that's not where our warfare is at, is in the flesh. And then he makes a statement that is a parenthetical statement, an explanation of why he said that. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now remember what he said in Ephesians 6. He said, we take to ourselves the whole armor of God. So those weapons, all those pieces of armor in Ephesians 6 are spiritual weaponry. And Paul again says here in 2 Corinthians, he says the weapons that we use are not fleshly. They're not carnal, but mighty. So that tells us that fleshly weapons are not mighty, but they are weak in a spiritual contest. So the enemy knows if he can keep you over in the flesh realm and keep you over in this realm of thinking people are the problem or the circumstances, the issue, he'll keep you weak. He'll keep you from winning the victory because you're not functioning or operating, <clears throat> excuse me, with the correct weapons. All right? Hallelujah. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought, so important, every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we see again, the word says we're not warring or fighting after the flesh, so that this is not a flesh fight. I have to defeat my flesh. I have to, to, to uh, cause my flesh to submit to the spirit, to my spirit every day. But it's not a flesh fight. Amen. The word goes on and tells us specifically who or what we're fighting. Where the battle is. Notice, he said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, here it is, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, why, why is this so important? Because that's the primary area the devil works in. Is in the area of my thoughts. In the area of my mind. That's why the Bible gives such an emphasis in the Word of God. To renew our mind. Not to be carnally minded, but to be spiritually minded. Why? That's the area the enemy works in the most. The Lord told me one time years ago. He said, the person that wins the mind wins the game. And the devil knows that. If he wins your mind, he wins your game. See, that, 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 that's where a lot of believers miss it. Because even though I am a spirit, and I possess a soul, and I live in a body, it's not a, it's not a coincidence that the Bible gave us that in, in uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, that He gave us that in that sequence. Spirit, soul, body. Alright? I am a spirit. I live in a body. I possess a soul. But the thing is, is that soul, that mind, our will, our emotions, our thinking faculties are right in between our spirit and our body. Now, the devil can most easily influence our body. But he influences our body through our minds. And if I'm constantly thinking flesh thoughts, taking flesh actions, doing flesh things, then my mind is going to be controlled by the flesh. Hallelujah. But if I'm, here it is, walking in the Spirit, 
bringing my mind into captivity. Bringing my mind into submission to the things of the Spirit. Then I'm going to be, here it is, spiritually minded. And have life and peace. Oh, glory to God. And, and, and that's what the devil doesn't want. He wants you to have a life on this earth void of life, God kind of life, Zoe life, and peace. He wants your life full of destruction and strife or destruction and oppression. He wants your life full of anything but peace. And the way he does that is through our thoughts. Hallelujah. If Satan can get a thought into your mind and get you to believe something that's incorrect, it creates a stronghold. And 2 Corinthians 4 and 4 says the way that he does that is by blinding the mind. That literally means to darken the perception. Well, how is my perception darkened? When a person begins to believe, for instance, that a person is their problem, their perception is darkened. The Lord used this for me years ago, and, and it may seem like an elementary example, but I learned something. Uh, I was uh, having to, uh, I was uh, applied for a job that required that I have a CDL license. And well, I had to take the, of course, the written test, and then I had to take uh, the driving test. And I learned something, that if you have a lack of depth perception, you cannot obtain a CDL license. Well, why? Because if you're backing a truck or another large vehicle that requires that type of licensing, if you're backing it up to a, a, a dock or a bay door, you have to be able to have a depth perception of how far away that dock is or that door is. If not, you'll run right into it. Cause damage to the vehicle, damage to the building, hurt somebody. You know, when, when your garage door opens up and you pull your car in, if you have a lack of depth perception, you can't tell how far the wall is away from your car. See, that's, that's an illustration of darkening the perception. He wants to limit your ability to perceive, and then he can create a stronghold in your life. Hallelujah. And this word stronghold is very important because uh, when the word was first used, it carried the idea of a fortress that kept people out. By the time Paul used it, it had come to mean a prison that kept people in. So in the beginning, it described a fortress that kept an enemy out of a person's life. By the time Paul used it, it described a, a prison that kept people in bondage and kept those that could help them outside. This perception. Darken the perception. Why? If he can get a thought in your mind and get you to believe it, then he can create a stronghold. This, this is why you see things at times that are totally unreasonable. People taking actions, doing things that are totally unreasonable. Why? The enemy's got a stronghold there in their mind. They, they're thinking wrong. Hallelujah. And the word says that our weapons are mighty for a reason. Number one, pulling down strongholds. And, and that word pulling down strongholds is not just, you know, it's not a, a nice easy word. It's a violent word. We're jerking them down. All right. He says the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hallelujah. The pulling down 
of strongholds. Then he said, they're mighty for casting down imaginations. Imaginings, imagings, thoughts. Hallelujah. Amen. I remember one time hearing a minister say, they were talking about driving down the road and uh, uh, they had their two little kids in the, back, in the back seat. And one of them said, no, devil, I cast that thought down in Jesus' name. And so the mom was driving and she said, well, honey, she said, uh, what thought are you casting down? And she said, oh, the devil just told me to reach over and break Max's leg. <laughs> now, if, if you get a thought to break somebody's leg, you know to cast that down. But the thing is, the enemy doesn't usually start there. He starts with something that seems inconsequential. I talked about that last week. Something that really doesn't, it doesn't cause that big of a stir or that big of a ripple in the lake. Amen. It'll usually start something like this. Well, what if this happened? Or how about this? Remember this conversation? Has God said? See, the devil didn't jump right out there and say, God's a liar. God didn't mean what he said. He started off by getting a thought into Eve's head that she wouldn't resist immediately. Has God said? Hmm. Right? That's how he starts. And if I let that germinate, if I let that stay there, it's going to create a stronghold, right? Because I'll, I'll make the statement again. Let me make sure I get it right. If Satan can get a thought into your mind and get you to believe something that's incorrect, it'll create a stronghold. Hallelujah. I've told you the story of sitting with a minister, a minister that I had and still have great respect for, but them looking at me, and referencing Romans chapter 4, they said, they said, Philip, for years we've been trying to call things that be not as though they were. And that's not in the Bible. We can't do that. They told me that. But yet the Bible says that's how God operates. And one translation says that Abraham became like God in that he called things that be not as though they were. How are you able to speak to the mountain and tell the mountain to move if you're not calling things that be not as though they were? How did, how did, that, how did that become what he thought? Because somewhere the enemy in, injected, introduced a thought that was inconsequential and it was probably something like this. Have you ever really thought about that verse? And then, have you ever really seen anything that you called that wasn't come to pass? But yet I've heard the same person minister and talk about doing that and things happening. The perception gets darkened. And what happens? There's, now there's a stronghold. Why? It wasn't pulled down. Why wasn't it pulled down? They didn't recognize what was happening you got to recognize that this is, the, this is the battleground. This is the mind game. All right? Casting down imaginations. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time on this. Uh, Pastor Michelle has a wonderful teaching on casting down imaginations. And she, she talks about the violence connected with this word. This is not something where you're just saying, no, that's not my thought. I reject it. No. You're grabbing it. You are violently casting it down. You're subduing it. You're bringing that thought into submission. Why? If I let it go, it's going to produce a stronghold in my life. Hallelujah. Do you see this? And then he said, you bring into captivity, notice, every thought. Whew. Wow. Wow. Every thought, not just what we would consider bad thoughts, every thought, 
every thought has to go through the filter of what does the Word say. Amen. That way, that way I'm bringing every thought into captivity to Christ, to the Anointed One, to the Word. I mean, it can be as simple as something like, I uh, wonder why sister so-and-so looked at you the way she looked at you in church. And you say, no, 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 no. I, I, listen, I don't know why she looked that way, but she loves me and I love her and we're sisters in, brothers and sisters in Christ and I refuse to think that way. I mean, you get on it the moment it tries to come into your life. Why? Because it's not going to stop there. The devil's going to do everything he can do to expand on that thought and take you down a road where you don't want to be. Amen. So we see what we're specifically fighting then are thoughts. What I'm specifically fighting is thoughts. And that's his method or his strategy is what? To get a thought. Or thoughts into our mind that he can use to defeat us. That's his method. That's his strategy. Now, here's the thing. Now, we know this. We understand this. So, we have to do, remember what Paul said, guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. What will do that? The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Oh, glory. Amen. Because see, if you give the devil an entrance, he'll come in. And, 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 those, and those, those exploratory thoughts are how he, what he uses to see if the doors are open. Or if there's an open door. If I give him that entrance, he'll come in. And, and here's something else you've got to learn. He'll take the path of least resistance. I'm not saying the enemy is not persistent. He is. But he, he will take the path of least resistance. If he knows that you'll succumb to worry, he'll send worry thoughts. If he knows you'll succumb to another type of thought, he'll send it. That's the path of least resistance. So he's studying, he's watching. What do they think on? What do they give their attention to? And very often what people have come to call oppression, possession, is just simply a person with a wrong thought pattern in their life and they're acting on those wrong thoughts. Well, that person needs deliverance. No, that person needs to change their mind. Is the devil blinding their mind? Yes. But authority can be taken over that and stop the blinding. I don't need to go through a system of deliverance to stop thinking the way I'm thinking. I just have to stop thinking the way I'm thinking. Because the enemy, the, well... The, the enemy will play in whatever area I give him ground to play in. And it, he'll take the path of least resistance. And for a lot of believers, that's their thought life. I'll keep saying this all the way through this series. There are no inconsequential thoughts. There are none. If the enemy puts a thought in your mind, it's never a thought that you can just shrug and say, well, that don't mean anything. It's a placeholder. It becomes a placeholder in your life. Now, the door is propped open. Worry is thinking and meditating on the wrong thing. And the Lord told me, he said, when you begin to worry and you begin to, to carry the care and you begin to meditate on those things, you, you hold the door open. You put a door stop there and it opens the door for everything else the devil wants to bring into your life. 
Hallelujah. In, uh, well, let me say this. The, the Lord said something to Pastor Caldwell one time concerning the church. He said, if you always do things the way I tell you, Satan will never get into your church. But you have to do things the way I tell you. So that means I'm always going back to what did God say? What did the Lord tell me? Over the years in ministry, I have developed the ability to not be intimidated by what people think I ought to do. Because very often, well-meaning people can implant a thought in your mind that the devil's trying to get in there. Well, have you thought about this? What if you did this? What if you did this other? Here's the question. What'd God tell you? That's what I got to go with. And keep that in the forefront of my mind. Amen. I Listen, when the Lord told us to uh, start the second church there in Little Rock, I, I had people that all but, but tried to talk me out of it. And I knew God had said to do it. I, I sat over lunch with a minister one time, and, and he warned me that he thought I shouldn't be doing this. You say, what'd you do, Pastor? I cast that thought down. But did you respect him? Yes, I still do. But I had to cast that thought down. Everybody else is not hearing from God for you. Amen. Now there are times God will send people to you and help you and we thank God for that. I've been that person at times that God has sent. I've had God send people to me and I praise God for that. But I've learned over the years that if I'm not cautious, people will look and they will interject their thoughts into what I should be doing for God. And if I'm not careful... I opened the door to the enemy. What did God tell you? You stay focused on that. Remember what Paul said? He said, once I knew what God had called me to do, immediately I conferred no more with flesh and blood. But he didn't say that people were bad or people were wrong. He said, once you know what you're supposed to do, Shut down the thought process. There's no more thinking about it. It is doing what God wants you to do. Hallelujah. And, and, and I have an answer for those thoughts at times. I am where God told me to be doing what God told me to do. So I'm going to succeed. Period. That's the answer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do, do, do you see that? Well, the people would just get behind what I'm doing. No, 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 it's not people. You doing what God told you to do and casting down those imaginations, staying out of that mental arena with the enemy. Brother Hagin always taught, you got to keep the devil in the arena of faith because if he gets you out of the arena of faith, he'll whip you every time. Remember what we said about him? We, 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 we use this. He's sneaky. He's crafty. He's deceptive. And you got to constantly be on your guard. Hallelujah. I've had people tell me before, you know what? Well, the Lord told me to tell you this. But right here I knew, I knew it wasn't God. And now that doesn't make them a bad person. They were being influenced. Amen. You see, in Romans 8, verse 5, Romans 8 and verse 5. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Say it out loud. I'm not going to be deceived. I know what God wants me to do, and I'm going to do it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Romans 8 and verse 5. 
it says, they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, notice, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So what do we see? The devil wants us to be naturally minded or carnally minded, flesh minded. Focused on the flesh. Focused on fighting the flesh. Focused on, on fighting flesh things. Why? So we keep our mind on the external. We keep our mind on the outward things. Hallelujah. Wrestling with external things. And He delights in us keeping our mind on that because then that way we, we never keep our mind on the answer. That keeps us from dealing with the real enemy that are what? The thoughts, the temptations, the imaginations that ought to be casting down. Amen. For instance, very elementary thought. Uh, you're going to fail financially. Well, that's not the time to start thinking on that. No. My God supplies all my need according to His riches in glory. I'll have all sufficiency in all things and abound to every good work. I've given, it's given unto me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God causes men to give into my bosom. Those verses are not just co uh, confession verses. They are weapons to cast down those thoughts. Amen. Well, you know, that pain that you experienced the other day, that could be something, that could be, that could be something bad. Well, what, what, what's the answer to that? First of all is, well, no, I don't believe it's going to be anything bad. And by His stripes, I am healed. He has taken sickness and disease from my midst and blessed my bread and my water. I will not die, but I will live and declare the works of the Lord. And so it's, 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 that is not just confessing the word and confessing something good. That is casting down those imaginations. That is refusing to be, here it is, carnally minded. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. But if you just let your mind run away with you. Pastor Michelle told the story uh, some time ago, early on in our marriage. Uh, of course, I, I worked in uh, corporate America, worked for an insurance company. And uh, uh, at that time, uh, I had to take the bus to work. Pastor Michelle drove the car that we had uh, for her job and to uh, run the kids back and two to school and take them where they need to be. And I had to, to ride the bus. Well, depending on what may happen or may not, weather or whatever it may be, at times there were delays. And she recognized something. I'm glad she did. She recognized something that uh, if, if I was running a little bit late, this thought process would start in her mind. And she'd st stand there at the window and begin to wonder, well, I wonder where he's at. And then the thought would come, wonder if he was in an accident. Wonder if something's happened. And she said, I began to, to notice I would I started I started getting fidgety and I started getting tense and 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 this wasn't just something that happened once or twice. It was something that began to be constant. If I was five minutes later than I should have been, oh it was it was this worry. And eventually she said, I had to recognize, I had to get a hold of that. Because it's just a matter of time before you start voicing that. And, and, and now, you are giving strength to the very thing that you don't want in your life. Because words are how authority is conveyed. And the moment you start saying it, your authority gets behind that. And so thankfully she got a hold of it before she started saying it. But my point is, she realized, I got to get a hold of this and I got to cast that imagination down. Now there are people, even believers, that will say, well, you were just concerned. You were just, you know, you were just concerned about your husband. No. It was turning into worry. 
Amen. A fleshly response. And she had to learn to cast that down. See, this is knowing your enemy. Hallelujah. And that, that, that's, that's what he'll try to do. Get you over into worry and call it concern. Get you over into worry and get you to start voicing that and call it just being concerned. No, you should. You got to cast that thought down. No, no, nothing's happened to my husband. God has satisfied him with long life. Amen. That will never happen to us. See, I'm casting that thought down. Amen. That, that, that's what you got to say. Uh, I, and, and, and let me say this. Am I helping you all with this? Pastor Michelle and I were in, uh, we were actually at the minister's conference. And every year that we go to the minister's conference, certain hotel we stay in, and uh, we go to the concierge room for breakfast. Uh, we generally don't get another meal there except breakfast uh, in the mornings because we're, we're generally out until uh, late at night. But we do enjoy breakfast there. And there's a dear woman that works there. She has worked there every year that we've been at the minister's conference. And she always remembers us, and we always talk, and, and she's very talkative. But, you know, this year, she started talking about some things that had went on. They had uh, discovered one of these sex trafficking houses in that area. And she started saying some things. She said, oh, I saw that, and I just began to worry. She said, because... You know, I've got, and she rattled it off, I've got a daughter this age, I've got a granddaughter this age, and oh, watch, it just worries me to no end. I'm just so worried about them. You know what our response was when she walked away from our table? That will never happen to us. That will never touch our family. Now people say, why do you say that? And we're not just saying it as a confession. We're casting down that thought. You understand, when you start entertaining thoughts like that, now the devil can manipulate your actions. And you can actually take an action that will contribute to the destruction he's trying to bring, or you can take an action that will take you away from the answer to the destruction he's trying to bring. No, that will never happen to us. Amen. When, when you're driving down the road and you see an accident and you see a pileup, yes, pray for those people, but also say, that'll never happen to us. Why? Well, I'm casting down those imaginations. That's how the enemy starts getting in there. I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me something happened that they had thought. You know, I had a feeling that was going to happen. I had a thought this morning that was going to happen. Well, a pastor would have cast him down the thought, stopped it, probably. And I can say by, by the virtue of the Word of God, yes. Because just what I told you, if they would have cast that thought down, they could have received instruction from the Holy Spirit about what to do to avoid it. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let me share one more scripture with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm not going to get through all this tonight. But praise God, we've got next Wednesday. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul said, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Young's literal says, I could not, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual, but as to fleshly, as to babes in Christ. Now these men were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us they were tongue talkers. They had the gifts of the Spirit operating in this church. 
to such a level that it was becoming a distraction. And yet Paul says you're fleshly. <laughs> he says there's things they could not talk about because they were fleshly. Well, what does that mean? It simply means they were more focused on the outward or the external. And that's what the devil wants. He wants us focused on the external so we can't perceive the real threat. What's really going on. And the devil had these saved, spirit-filled people fighting each other and not him. Amen. That's, that's why, listen, don't mess with strife. Don't, don't even get into it. Don't, it, it, it opens a door. In my, in my family, in my church, in my relationships, just don't get into it. Don't criticize. Why? That opens a door. I, I'm not talking about telling the truth about something. I mean being critical. R remember, criticalness is your opinion. That's just what I think. Not based on the word, it's what I think. That, that's what the Bible says in the book of Luke when it says, Judge not and you'll not be judged. That word is criticize. Don't be critical. All right? Now, let me see where I can jump off this at. If the devil can get us fighting each other, then he can work unhindered. But remember, flesh and blood are not our problem. They're not our enemy. Our fight is against the thoughts and the lies of the enemy. Amen. I've, listen, I've watched people get moved away from where they said God brought them by the thoughts and the lies of the enemy. And that's his goal, is to get you moved away from what you know God wants you to do. But let, let me share this with you as we wrap this up. The devil cannot forcibly take away the word or our faith. He has to get us focused on the flesh and get us to give it up. Because he cannot forcibly take away the word out of your life if you don't give it up. Well, what do I do if those thoughts keep coming? Well, Ephesians 6.13 6, tells us, it says, having done all to stand, stand. Having done all to stand. When thoughts keep coming, what do you do? You stand. Having done all to stand means having overcome all. So no matter what thoughts came or what thoughts come, you refuse to get in the flesh. You refuse to cave in. You stand your ground. You stand in love and faith. And you stand. You refuse to get in strife. You refuse to get in, in, in criticism. You stand, and there is nothing the devil could do to move you or stop you. Why? You overcame all. You overcame all. And that's what will happen every time. This is the importance of knowing our enemy. Amen? Praise God. Well, if there's anyone in the congregation tonight, you need prayer. You need someone to agree with you. Our prayer ministers are coming right now, and they're going to meet you at the altar. If you would like prayer, just come, and they will be glad to meet with you and to pray with you and to, to agree with you concerning your needs in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's such a blessing to see what God is doing in the lives of His people. Amen. Well, come on. Say it with me. The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you. We'll see you next service.